Hi, my name is Elaine Smallock, and I am the Director of Writing Services and Training Grant Development in MyHub, which is our Professional Development and Career Services Center at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. Today I put together a short video about how to approach writing a scientific manuscript. So whether it's your first time writing a manuscript or you're a seasoned writer and you just want to brush up your skills, the information in the video that follows is just giving you some logistical information and some considerations and tips that will essentially provide you a toolkit that you can use to better communicate your scientific findings. So please review the slides and at the end I'll be back to let you know how you can reach out to me if you would like further assistance with your writing project. Hi everyone, so this brief video tutorial is intended to provide some tips and some advice on how to write your manuscript, whether you're a first time writer or you're revisiting the process. We'll provide some tips to how to approach the writing process as well as some advice on how to structure and format the different parts of the manuscript, everything from the introduction, materials and methods, results, and discussion, as well as title and abstract. If after this session you still feel like you'd like some more help or you want to talk about the writing process, you can schedule an appointment with me through the link that you see on this slide. All right, so approaching writing. I know for many people it can be very stress-inducing. For a lot of people, they have anxiety when they hear the word writing. And there are some tactics out there to try to alleviate some of that stress. One of the ones I use is just this five minute research review. So I work with trainees in coaching them how to talk about their research in a very brief, concise way in five minutes. The advantages of this exercise are that not only does it help you with your communication and presentation skills, but it actually will help your writing because in doing this exercise, you'll actually sketch out or outline your paper because you will in this five minutes, Go through the background significance of your research, why it's important, why you have a project. You'll briefly summarize the results that you have up to this point, and you'll provide conclusions that put context to those results as it relates back to the background and significance. And the more comfortable you get doing this, whether it's just meeting somebody in the hallway or in the elevator, or you're trying to explain it to a family or friend who doesn't know anything about your work, or to somebody who knows a lot about your work, you're just getting practice talking about it, and then those words can then be converted to written word later on. So this is a really good exercise to practice. Now, aside from doing that part, there's also logistics and time management that you really need to consider when you're starting to write a manuscript. And I like to think about things moving backwards in that you have a goal for when you wanna submit a manuscript and then you need to plan accordingly. So in order to do this, there are some things that are very important. So first you need to realize and discuss how realistically close are you to actually submitting? How much data do you need to collect? Who else needs to contribute? Who should, are there any more collaborators you need to bring in? What's missing in order for you to actually write a complete story and submit it? This can only be understood by frequent conversations with your mentor and, and your research team and presenting your work frequently. Next, you have to think about which journal or audience you wanna target. If you're gonna be very specific and narrow with the topic because it's really targeted, then you wanna make sure you pick the right journal for that. If you wanna be more broad because you wanna have a farther reaching um, audience, then you wanna pick a journal that actually in fact can um, include more of an audience for you. Lastly, conversations about authorship, although they can be awkward, I know, are actually very, very important. It's important to have them early because if you are first author, the expectation normally, conventionally, is that you create, you collect the data, you create the figures, you put the story together, and you write the first draft of the manuscript. And then, of course, all the other co-authors come in and they contribute as well. But sometimes there are questions about that. So it's good to have those questions early with your team so there are no surprises at the end which delay you actually getting to submit your manuscript. So these are some logistics and time management tips to be thinking about. Um, in terms of uh, composing the, the manuscript and actually working towards publication. Now I'd like to transition more into the different parts of the manuscript, including how do you write the introduction, the results, and the discussion. So I'd like to first start with the results. Results are very important. They are the heart um, of your story, of your research, and they need to be communicated very well. The best way to write the results, in my opinion, is to do them in tandem with the figures. What that means is, as you collect data, which you do with every experiment, you organize that data and you are accurate with um, recording it, whether it's in your virtual notebook or your physical lab notebook, wherever it should be, you're collecting it. 
But beyond just collecting it, you're also actively converting it into figures, whether those be bar graphs, pie charts, data tables, um, actual images that you've uh, you acquired off a microscope, whatever it should be, you're taking that data and you're beginning to visualize it. Because without that visualization process and the presentation process, the writing becomes very difficult. So these three parts of this writing the results are very, very important. The more you present your work and you show your figures, the easier it will be to start to write them. And in fact, when you're writing the results sections up, you wanna be looking right at the figure and the images that you've created. And oftentimes we do this in PowerPoint or Prezi or whatever the um, visual communication platform is that you choose. But in these, these platforms, there's also a note section at the bottom of the slides that allows you to write notes into there. Many people use them to help them with presentation, but those note sections are actually quite important for helping write your manuscript as well. Because as you're looking at the figure, you can actually start writing notes about the data. You can start actually writing um, the whole results section that will go into the paper. So I highly advise using this flow, collect, convert, present, and write, to start writing your results section as you get the data. Now, when you write the results, right? It's, and by results, I mean that each section in the results is usually dedicated to a specific figure based on the flow that I just provided in the last slide. But for each of those results, for each of those figures, there's a formula that you can use to sort of make sure that your writing is consistent. And for each result section where you describe the figure, the three major components that you need to tell the story, a little vignette of that figure, of the rationale, the data description, and a summary of that data. Okay. So the rationale is simply a statement, or maybe two, of the purpose for why you did that experiment. Right? That could be based in the literature. For instance, previous work showed, da 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 da. Therefore, we did this. Or it could be based on a figure already shown in your in your own manuscript. For instance, figure one showed this. So next, we did this. And what it does, it gives a little context for the reader so they're not lost. If they're only reading that section, they understand why you did that experiment. Then after that, you write and explain the data. This is where you only provide the observations, so a bit factual, not interpretation. Right? This is where you describe in the comparisons between groups or data sets or data points or images or whatever it is you're describing in that figure. You make comparisons and you walk the reader through what, what is there. How I coach students to understand if they've written a good data section is after you've written the text, give it to somebody else who has not seen the figure and don't give them the figure and see if they can draw a picture based on what you wrote. If they come up with a visualization or some graphic element that matches the figure that you've actually created in terms of patterns, even if it's a line graph versus a bar graph, but it's telling the same thing, then you've written a really good data section. If it doesn't match your actual figure, then you can revise because something isn't very clear. So this is part of that process. Then to close out that particular subsection in the results for that figure, include a summary sentence. Something like, these data suggest, these data strongly show. That puts the ribbon on the present, if you will, and wraps everything together so that the reader clearly understands what the major conclusion of that figure is. And you repeat this formula for every figure or figures if they go together for the paper. Right? So this is a repetitive process. And again, take some time. So that's why I encourage everyone to write the figures and the um, results in tandem. Now, one thing to remember that sometimes the, less, the best laid plans change. So even though you have a very specific goal or specific way you want your manuscript written, it doesn't always turn out that way. And sometimes that's just okay. So remember that your results don't need to be presented and written in the order in which you actually obtain that data. In fact, the data you got today may actually be what should be presented first is figure one in the paper. And you have to be open to making sure that you can rearrange the figures um, to make sure that the story makes sense. So avoid this flaw in thinking that you have to do everything linearly because in research, things sometimes happen serendipitously that are beneficial right now, right before you submit the paper and you need to somehow incorporate it into the story. So be open to that. And the best way to do that is, be, is to have frequent conversations with your mentor and be presenting your work frequently. All right, moving on from the results, let's talk about materials and methods. So materials and methods don't have to be written after the results. They can actually be written 
whenever, and actually they can be written continuously as you're doing experiments. It doesn't matter when you write them, but what does really matter is the level of detail. So rigor and reproducibility are incredibly important. They matter. So even if you think you've written too much, that you're too detailed, it's okay. More is better here. You need to tell the reader everything that they need to know to be able to repeat the experiment so that the science is actually rigorous. If there isn't enough room at the end in terms of word count because the journal has a word limit, that's okay. It can either be shortened or you can maybe put it in a supplement, but it's better to be detailed up front and have more there than to have to go back and try to fill in everything. So be detailed. Moving on to the introduction of your manuscript. So introductions um, have three major components to them. There should be a brief historical background and overview of the topic that you are discussing um, or that your, your work has um, addressing, is, your work is addressing. Um, and that could be something like, for instance, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of mortality among a certain age group. And then there could be a little bit more detail about the history of cardiovascular disease and particularly in that age group, maybe genetics, things like that. And then based on the literature so far, you wanna identify the gap in the field. Maybe we don't have enough information about certain genes, or maybe we don't know how certain cells behave. And this is a problem in the field. You wanna make that very clear to your reader. Then at the very end, at the pinnacle, you wanna present the question that your specific study is addressing related to that gap. Introductions do not need to be long. In fact, they just need to have enough information and references that give contextual understanding for the purpose of your study. Right? So it's a very heavily referenced section and that's why you can shorten the writing and have more references. And then the readers can go to those references to get more information. Right? Okay, then the last part of the manuscript is the discussion, which does typically need to be written last because you can only do so after the story is actually written, which is the results. But sometimes starting off the discussion is it feels really difficult because this is where you are not just discussing your data, but you're going a little bit deeper. So to help start this process of writing the discussion, I'd say start with first paragraph, start little. And in that first paragraph, just ground yourself by reminding the reader of the goal of the study or the purpose, which is really what you presented in the last section of the introduction. Then summarize the primary findings that you have. So you can recycle those summary sentences that you had in each results vignette. And then the significance of these findings. What does it do for the field? How does it move the needle in the research world? New innovation, new knowledge. What are you contributing with this work? That's the best way to frame the discussion and to help ground the reader, especially because sometimes the reader doesn't always read the whole paper. They might start with the discussion. This gives them context for understanding the data that you've actually presented. Now, after this, after this first paragraph, then you move forward with the, the meat of the discussion, which is where you interpret the data, where you draw educated inferences based on the results as you presented them and as they relate to the current literature. I know that this can be sometimes the most overwhelming part because this is now where you are drawing comparisons and contrasts, and there's no necessarily right or wrong answer, but you're trying to make connections to what's already been published out there. So this is the schematic that I use to try to help guide um, those who are writing manuscripts. So you think about your data, and if you've identified what the major findings are as you've laid them out in that first paragraph, you can break each finding into its own paragraph or two. And then for each of those major findings, you compare and contrast that finding with what's already known in the literature, and then summarize why that's important. And if you follow that pattern for each of the major findings, you will have actually put together a nice interpretive discussion that fits the results of your, in the story of your manuscript. Now, as I said with the results, again, best laid plans can change. And sometimes the findings that you wanna present in the discussion aren't necessarily in the order in which they are in the results in terms of the figure order, and that's okay. Sometimes figure five actually has the most interesting and most important finding and you wanna discuss it first. So again, being open to how you order these things. But to start, take each major finding, compare and contrast with the literature, create bullet points of the articles that are most important, create sentences that summarize those articles, and then summarize how your work relates to that then you'll have a good structure for your discussion section. Now, lastly, you write the title and abstract. So the title should be very concise and direct. If it's too long, 
your readers may not read the whole thing because they quickly scan in PubMed, as you're probably aware from doing so yourselves. So you want to be very concise and use the keywords that actually will draw them into the paper. In terms of the abstract, again, it's the last thing that you write because you have to tell the whole story first in writing the paper. But the abstract should be structured. There should be an objective, a method, a results, and a conclusion. And sometimes you can even use these headings in the actual abstract, and sometimes the journals will require it. But in any case, whether you use those headings or not, these four elements need to be there. And if you remember back to my first tip on how to approach writing, this is really your five minute research review. So if you've gotten really comfortable telling people about the background, the findings and your conclusions, you've actually written the abstracts verbally and you can use that to your advantage when you actually write this section. And then the keywords, which again are very important because they help the librarians at PubMed, um, at the NIH, um, index your, your article so it can be found by the right audiences. So you wanna be very intentional there as well. And lastly, to sum it all up, to get to the finish line, to actually submit your paper, it is a process and I call it the re four process because you need to write it, but then you need to read it carefully. You need to review it, not just by yourself, but in context with all of your authors and other people who can give you feedback. Based on that collective feedback, you revise it. Then you need to repeat this whole process, read, review, revise, because it takes sometimes two, three, four iterations until you're actually ready to submit your manuscript. So be aware that it takes time and build this into your timeline, as we talked about on an earlier slide. All right, so with that, this, like I said, this was a brief, quick tutorial on how to approach writing a manuscript. So the main thing I want you to take home from this is that writing is a process, not an event. Plan ahead, present as often as you can, create those figures and write as you actually collect your data so you're staying on top of it and it won't feel so anxiety building at the end when you go to actually write. And then remember that it takes time. So read for, read, review, revise, and repeat. If you follow all this, this will be helpful in getting your paper submitted and hopefully towards publication. So thank you for watching this short video about how to write a scientific manuscript. Hopefully it gave you an idea of how to get started writing or like I said, it gave you some skills that you could brush up on as you write maybe your second, third, or fourth manuscript. So if you need further assistance with any of your writing projects, please feel free to reach out to me and schedule an appointment using our handshake scheduling tool at myhub.urmc.edu. I hope to see you soon. Thank you.